Welcome, everybody. I think I've uh, mentioned earlier today uh, that I really love the art on Silver Ball Mania, and I'm so happy that the Silver Ball Mania guy is the most prominent guy on our poster. Um, and, and remember, he's not naked because he's chrome-plated. That counts as clothing. <laughs> Uh, and we are so honored to have uh, the guy who did Silver Ball Mania. I, I paid that game the ultimate compliment, Kevin. When that game came out, I bought the back glass from the distributor, NOS, just to have the back glass because this is like the ultimate mirrored back glass and uh, it seems like you had a chance to do something that was just your mind saying, what is so great about pinball? So let's start there. Please welcome Kevin O'Connor, pinball artist. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. As a young man growing up in the newly developing suburbs west of Chicago, um, we were surrounded by prairies and nearby woods where we, as boys would back then, carved out makeshift baseball diamonds, uh, climb trees in the forest pretending we're Robin Hood or World War II soldiers like our dads being born in the 50s. And for 25 cents in grade school, I would draw a World War II tank or a battle scene on your school folder for 25 cents so i it would, commercial artist i would say that would be my first first commercial art job if you will um we can go with the slides now in 1965 i was 13 so i was coming of age and the beatles had hit on ed sullivan batman was on tv and i saw my first james bond movie which you know as a 13-year-old blew my mind. So let's get some of um, my most serious influences here. Um, I just love, I would pour through Mad Magazine, uh, the uh, art of Mort Drucker and Jack Davis. We would be able to go to the, down to the corner drugstore and browse as much as we wanted on the newsstand, and there were comic books and, you know, a creepy magazine, and... Um, I just love the art of the detail of the art of Hal Foster and was greatly influenced by uh, covers of Frank Frazetta at that point. Uh, this is these you know they were they were paper paperback novels. They, we, this is before the time when they would say, hey, if you're not going to buy something, you get out of here. They, the ladies were nice in the drugstore and we could browse any anything we wanted. And this is uh, another. Uh, influence. Robert McGinnis was a big influence. His uh, paperback covers and movie posters, uh, I would just, you know, you couldn't get me away from the, the movies after I saw the movie. I would just stand and, you know, my parents would try to drag me away from the movie poster, which was outside. Uh, this is Frank McCarthy's work, and, you know, I just love the explosiveness of it. And, uh, you know, I was greatly influenced by that also. So, I don't, it's going to be hard to get through these notes. I think uh, I'm better yeah, off well just. You, yeah, we yeah. had Paul Ferris here, so <clears throat> we know yeah. that he came to Bally. And if anyone wants to really get, in, get into the how the Bally Art Department first began, you should probably take a look at uh, Paul Ferris's. Let's hear it for Paul Ferris. He was great here. <laughs> and, um, but I started out um, in, a, in a printing house where I was, you know, packing boxes on the dock. And, uh, you know, someone from the office came down and said, you know, you're not very good at this. Is there anything else you know how to do? And I said, well, you know, I'm t t you know I, I can draw. I take some art classes. So um, I went upstairs and started drawing uh, industrial parts for catalogs. That's what they printed was industrial catalogs. 
So eventually I wanted to move on and, um, you know, just like looked at ads in the paper and I found an ad for a point of purchase design, which I had no idea was. But um, this is basically the kind of uh, display that, you know, it was, they would be in bars, uh, there were, there were uh, you know, the grocery store displays, all, all sorts of things that we did, but mostly they were lit up in um, injection molded plastic. And, and it was here that I started to hone m magic marker skills, and that's what all the designers used to to, to uh, present their ideas. Um, eventually, I worked in two point of purchase studios, so I had quite a good portfolio of design. And um, at this point, I, I, I was determined to uh, move forward to with my illustration uh, interests. So uh, I answered an ad in the paper that said, Artist wanted for the world's largest manufacturing of coin operated machinery. I asked my dad what that was. He says, I have no idea. It's probably a vending machine <laughs> company. But uh, So I went, and um, this is the building that I entered. And it had, as you can see on the side here, it had this great big sculpture of a, you know, abstract person surrounded by, you know, balls. And, and it was, you know, very, very intriguing. Uh, and the person that met me in the lobby was Paul Ferris, and um, we, he, he was impressed with the, I probably had a, about an inch thick of designs that had nothing to do with, you know, they're all magic marker designs of, you know, products and whatever, but I think that most of uh, the thing that we most hit it off with was that I had copied, this was quite a large painting that I did, and it was a, uh, I believe it was a cover of a creepy magazine done by Frank Fazetta, and that sealed the deal. I, he hired me almost on the spot right there because of this painting that I had brought, dragged in, you know, with the head of frame on it and everything. <laughs> so let's see what else we got here. Um, so when I entered the department, uh, it was Paul, uh, Margaret Hudson, and um, I think Al and Dick White, who had worked at Ad Posters before, were doing slot machines. And, and this was up in an engineering department with uh, 200 engineers. Yeah, so Dick White is known for like 4 million BC. So kind of a thick lined, a uh, few colors, but uh, hyper realistic detail on that one. And his more cartoony stuff would be yeah. like the uh, Nippet, was another Dick White. Yes, um, I think Paul at the time had he was working on eight ball, um, and, he, and he had he had done the Evil Knievel, I think at that point also. But the person I was most influenced by, or you know, uh, was Dave Christensen. And, uh, you know, he he was a guy. He was a quiet guy who worked in the corner, and uh, you know, he had extreme detail in his ink work. Uh, that, that he he would noodle over for you know hours and hours. He wor he did not work very fast, but you know when I saw some of his work, I was just you know blown away by it, and I was like, that's that's how I want my my work to look. Um, this is one of my favorites. Voltan escapes cosmic doom. He's saying it was such a beautiful place once, and she says, forget it, baby, we're on our way. Um, um, <laughs> You know, is it typical Dave Christensen to put a little, you know, a, a, just a little touch of his personality in right, these that's things? Chicago skyline is what's burning, <laughs> I've been told. Mm, yes, nuclear holocaust. This is my first game that I did. It was done with, you know, the style that they were using at the time, which was the rapidograph pen, which is an ink pen that has a needle in it. And I had already had um, experience with it with my industrial drawings so I was I was okay there but the the, the color part of it uh, I, I believe I got helped out there uh, from Margaret Hudson she was a, our, our, the production she was doing most of the production in those days we'd cut each silk screen separately 
So we can say, for example, that that the red, it's very uniform red because that is a screen for just, if the red Absolutely. is going on, the red is going on 100% saturation. Right, these were screened right on glass, so it would be first you'd, you have your black line, then everything had to line up after that, the yellow, red, blue, and so on. So you'd have probably about 12, 13 screens on one board, or colors. And that and includes it, white because there is no white background. So the white's like the last, right? The white is the last screen that goes on. And mirror was always first, but it was done somewhere else. This is actually the magic marker sketch for the first, my first planned four color, which is a process, like a litho process that Paul was trying to introduce for us to do on glass. So um, as you could see, I, you know, my marker, magic marker skills were coming into play there because I could display what the, the full range of color that I was going to uh, use on this. And sometimes I like looking at this better than I like looking at the other one, be, um, I mean the actual pr uh, production piece because the production piece is a black line, which I don't have anymore. And then behind it is airbrush painting, so all this sky and everything was blended softly. So all I have is that that part. I don't have the black part, but I have the the background painting to it. There's the finished product with the black line and the softer. Uh, so this is like a home pinball machine. Yeah, that was like a home pinball machine. Uh, Supersonic was another uh, chance for me to use airbrush on that. And uh, let's see what we got here. And then, uh, well, silver. before we get to the okay. silver ball mania, okay. were, were you and Paul uh, talking about you want to show how different your art was than the other companies? Like, was the airbrush like a positive thing that the blending, so you were deliberately showing off all well, the stuff I, you could do? I can't think of any other company that was doing it at the time. And actually, Paul had not done airbrush either, or, sun, or even seen anyone do it. Um, I, I I learned it at the second studio, uh, stu the point of purchase studio that I had worked at, mm -hmm. where we, were, you know, I worked in a. It was like a, it was like a small closet that had a, a big you know, exhaust over the top of it, and, and lined up were, uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off track here, but lined up were all uh, lacquer paints, and, uh, you know, it would be like five guys standing in a row airbrushing lacquer paint, and we'd have masks on, but it didn't really work, and it, it did affect my uh, lungs after a while, but that's where I learned my airbrush was fr at this studio, so I brought that in, and no one else had been doing that at at Bally and um, Paul was just painting with a you know traditional brush and paint or that's how he wanted to when he first painted Lost World so this was another combination of a black line ink drawing um, which we I believe we we printed it like with a light blue ink onto a board so that it would so that my airbrush would match perfectly when we put the black over it, and then I and the rest was done with airbrush in the back, and I get, also got a chance to do layouts for for these brochures too. So I was at working with the advertising people too. Uh, this is actually the this is a magic marker sketch also, and at the time I was doing them full size, so they were pretty big magic marker sketches. Um, you know, Kiss was the size of Kiss, which is bigger than the back glass. I, we would do them slightly bigger, maybe 20% bigger than than we were, so that when we uh, reduce it a bit, it would get t just tighten up a little bit. So I'm going to show you a lot of magic marker sketches because you've already seen the rest of. Uh, uh, this is another airbrush sort of tour de force that I had. They they actually of uh, eventually Bally. Uh, built an exhaust system right in my uh, cubicle actually <laughs> and so it just went out the the door and this that uh, orb thing in the center that was a separate p 
pieces. Of that, it. that was uh, yeah, photography, and uh, the eye belongs to Margaret Hudson, <laughs> who was uh, you know do, right right there with us doing production. Uh, around the time when uh, this is the t around the time when I believe the first Black Knight was the yeah a two two level concept. So you know. Uh, we got we got busy. The marketing wanted we've got to come out with two level, so I got involved with. Uh, I actually did probably pre three D uh, or SolidWorks. I would sketch the, what what it would look like, you know, in perspective, and um, so this is probably like one of, one of my first sketches that uh, Gary Gayton started cutting as a, a white wood. For a game, I think we were going to call it Kronos, but I, that we had a lot of, and, and actually envisioned it as three levels. So this is how it evolved. I'll go through these, but you can. I want you to notice some of the ramps in the middle, some of the two two metal ramps in the middle, and see if we can find some similarity in what how this evolved. This also was. Yeah, what's a, that big round thing? That was a. Uh, I think it was going to be a. It was. Maybe not a spinning disc, but it was uh, it was a disc, disc that if you lit up from behind, it it had it like dispersed color. So they were going to play tricks with the lights on that. Um, so actually, eventually, uh, Gary Gayton went on to uh, to a different game, and um, uh, I, these. I think I switched the order on these, but these are some ideas for two level games. Double Agent, Double Dynamite, all <laughs> like thumbnail sketches. Double Deck, <laughs> Pirate Game. Had to have double in there. Yeah. Samurai, he had two swords. Um, so, but eventually when Gary was still on the project, he liked the name Kronos because he was going to try to tie in a, a timed theme to it. And here's another version, though, that was a little bit more finished that I had, which I did on black paper with uh, uh, colored pencils. To also, Tron was coming into. Uh, yeah, it, it was during Tron that time, movie. so I, I I was trying to uh, simulate this vector look, but just with uh, traditional art. So eventually. This is what the two-level game evolved in, and you can still see the two ramps that, that I had envisioned, but Claude Fernandez at this point had taken over the game, and Tom Neiman from marketing came to us with, uh, said they had this De, De Laurentiis movie that they were gonna tie into. It was Flash Gordon, which, you know, I was a big fan of the black and white one with the spaceship that had the sparklers coming out uh, and sort of falling down on the ground and going, you know, puck, 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 oh, you know. <laughs> I've got so. a question here mm -hmm. about, you've, you've talked about uh, some learning from the uh, point of purchase studios and so forth, but when you get to this point, somebody has to tell you the unfortunate limitations of doing the play field. So that arrow is going to be there, and the bonus lights. Maybe you can negotiate a little bit of the placement, but you've got a lot of stuff to work around here. So how did how did you learn that? Did you have coaching, a mentor? Or something? I just would ask the designer what are the rules and figure out a way to tie them in. You know, like the, this is Emperor Ming's castle here. Um, in those days, the designers. They weren't as art savvy as the designers are today, and they would pretty much give you a free hand and say, "Yeah, that that'll work as long as you had their rule 2x on the on the arrow." That's really all they cared about. Um, once in a while, we'd be able to discuss whether or not you know this array of lights down at the bottom, um, you know, could it be uh, rearranged to fit art better but basically it's what they gave you most in those days the whitewood was finished and then it would come to us it it didn't evolve really through our through the art department it, it just came to us 
practically so, finished. So you weren't in the daily stand-ups as the game design That's was true. evolving and all that, yeah. This is a the way the painting looked without the extra silk screen of solid, what we call spot colors, um, and, the, and the mirror, which was the first screen that was put on there. It would, it would come to the printers uh, with the mirror already done from another source. But this is the way the, uh, the painting looks that I have. And uh, Sam Jones, who was kind of scheduled to be here and wasn't able to for reason, different reasons. Okay. Yeah, I, I finally, you know, one day Joe Kamenko called me. This is, this is recently. And in his, in his the way he, his in, inimitable way, he was like, Kevin, Sam Jones is on the phone. I'm like, Sam Jones on the phone. Oh, hello, Sam. He goes, Kevin O'Connor. And we got around to talking, and um, and he and I I mentioned that I still had the painting. He goes, Oh my God, you still have the painting. Oh, we got to trade. We got we got to find. We got to trade something. So I'm like, I don't know if, if you know. He goes, I got T-shirts. I got all sorts of you know memorabilia, and I'm like, I I don't. You know, even though I had collected toys and all that sort of thing, I, I'm trying to get rid of stuff now. I'm not trying to collect anymore. So I was like, he goes, and, I, and I, I, I sense Joe in the background. You know, so he said, well, maybe you don't want to part with it, but you know, we want to do posters. So that's sort of in the works where he's going to sign half the posters, send them to me. I'll sign half. So who knows? In, in the future, we might have Flash Gordon posters with. Sam Jones. Uh, yeah, I think he's going to be down at Texas again uh, in March. He does a lot of conventions. It's kind of his life, really. Right oh, he's in Framingham for uh, is it the Comic-Con that competes with the Comic-Con we're aligned with uh, is happening right now. Yeah, so he's here in, in the neighborhood. Uh, he's got a... Uh, he's got... It, it's a whole movie actually I it's, what's it called uh, something life as flash or something like that and it goes in depth into what happened to his career after Flash Gordon where he you know had disagreements with the De Laurentiis family and it sort of ruined his career but he did wind up with a lot of uh, credits uh, TV credits and some movie credits also uh, Viking, that was, I, I believe the design was Jim Patla, and he came to me with a white wood and said, do whatever you want. And at that time, you know, I had been crazy about the movie The Vikings, and I was also reading the, the book The Vikings, and it had a scene uh, from this King Harold's Hall of uh, this fight between the hero and the It is Jim Patla. Okay. So we got our references right here. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that that was one where I had a free hand to do whatever whatever I want, and um, I thought this this PowerPoint uh, I, I updated it with a magic marker sketch, but this is the painting anyway. So this is the full painting without any displays in it, which yeah everybody's seen this, so I'll move on. We'll continue. Everyone's seen Kiss. <laughs> this is the the. Paul has a be had a better picture of this, but this is the this is uh, Kiss approving or disapproving the magic marker sketch. But you can see the size of the of it here, and with Tom Tom Neiman and Paul Ferris, they took this to. Uh, oh yeah, that looks like Paul Ferris over there. Yeah, and Tom Neiman's right up in the corner of there, and they took this to one of their concerts, which was at a Mac Magic Mountain amusement park in California and they had they were in full makeup ready to go on stage when they you know did their uh, approval of this with with some changes where whereas they wanted to be portrayed more as superheroes with you know muscles and it's the same, Kevin. okay good thanks skateball was uh, Greg Ferris actually did the back glass on this, but at that time, if we got in a bind, in a time time crunch, we, I would uh, take on the play field. I was pretty quick at inking, and I was starting to develop 
starting to get away from the rapidograph pen and starting to use more a brush and it was things were going much faster with me anything mechanical i would use the pen like to circle inserts which was all done by hand back then and um but like figures and any of that sort of thing i, I started using a brush more more like a comic book artist would. Now I have a question, since you, this is one where you divided up the art, mm -hmm. so nowadays we think of some other components, so the cabinet, is, was that you or Greg or yet another person, do you remember that? Or the, I think I did that cabinet the and that plastics. was, uh, plastics are mine also. I think I did that cabinet also, but you know, you're very limited as what, what you could do on the cabinet they had. It was all stencil work and sprayed stencil, so they had huge metal stencils with handles on them. And one guy would put the, put it up there, and the other guy would come across and spray it on there. So it was, a, you know, kind of primitive, and and also very limiting in what we could do. We couldn't, you couldn't cut cut into the metal and have it too thin in one spot because the paint wouldn't go in the right place. But How about the tolerances, <coughs> they are registered in registration to an extent, but mm -hmm. you probably couldn't get very fine. Tolerances. No, not really. Um, KISS was probably the most uh, detailed that I, the sides, of, I had the, their portraits on the side of that, and those, that's still the stencil uh, technique. This is the original Magic Marker sketch for Star Trek that had the uh, TV show what we call the pajama uniform and later on after I finished this painting this is the way I finished it and Paramount came to us and said we're putting this movie out we really want to change the uniforms so I used and, a, and this too the Enterprise the Enterprise I, I'm not sure that I changed it. It, it it didn't it wasn't very different in the first movie mm -hmm. um, also they they nixed any sort of violence on there, like the, uh, oh, the guy phaser, the guy getting, the background there. yeah. Um, so I, I had the painting and I took, it's it's basically like a big can of whiteout from back then, but it's it, it dries to like a canvas texture and it was called gesso. And I had to gesso all over everyone's uniform and repaint them with the new uniforms on that became the back glass. This is the painting before I uh, gessoed it. Here's some of the original crew, and um, you know the, we had we had some fun in the studio. Um, this Paul Ferris is the guy waving in the on the side. I'm in the back. I believe I'm looking over my cubicle, and. Could my tie get any wider? I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and there's Greg, and obviously beards were the thing back then, uh, as they are now, again. Uh, but Greg, um, I recommended Greg from one of my point of purchase studios that we worked at together. Uh, it was a really nice modern studio, and you know it was a great place to work, but I, we both wanted to be illustrators. But I believe he came in to work the cameras at first with, you know, and Paul promised him we'll work you into you know, il the illustration as time went by. But we became such good friends over the years and, and still are. And he spent many years in my band as the drummer of a band called the Hypnos, which you know lasted for years. That's Mary Beth Bush in red, and she was... Um, uh, doing a lot of advertising uh, or helping out with the advertising and, and creating brochures. And Margaret Hudson, a be all around beautiful person, was doing all our production work, you know, cutting screens, cutting the screens for the uh, play fields, mostly in the plastics. Uh, Dave Christensen. While, while I'm while I'm telling you that we cut them, we cut them out of this material called amberlith, and you you would cut out you, what what you want where you wanted the ink to be, and peel away where you didn't want it to be. So it was a very tedious job. Margaret was very good at that, and she was a very good worker. Um, 
the point I was going to add in here is Dave Christensen never allowed anyone to do that. He would ink every single screen. So that's why, you know, he his games took a little bit longer to, to get out. They could never give him one that they needed quickly. And I don't know, who the, I can't remember who the guy, he, the, it was a marketing guy with the black hair and black beard. I, I don't really remember his name. But, you know, we were a family, a small family that, uh, we had a lot of fun and a lot of good times. And this is still at Western and Belmont. And before we moved to Bensonville, Illinois, where we added, um, first, I believe we added Tony Ramone. And I'm not sure where he came from. I think he came from Williams. Not sure, but uh, then um, Pat McMahon, who came on a work, uh, uh, Art Institute work program to us and, and, and evolved into an illustrator, and also Doug Watson. Uh, I wasn't, I, I had left the. Yeah, it looks like Tony Vermoney did come from Williams. Okay. At this point in 1990, I got a, uh, a chance to apply for, to be the art director of Bally Midway. And at the time, Midway was, you know, uh, emerging into, uh, you know, the video, video game industry. And they were doing well with Pac-Man and Mrs. Pac-Man. And I thought this would be a good avenue to, like, you know, expand and into so I took the job as art director and uh, there I did I was mostly doing a lot of concepts with markers uh, this this one on the lower left is what it would have been a scrolling game I you would call it and that was for masters of the universe that was one of my ideas the other so, one so the Zaxxon type yes scrolling. exactly Zaxxon there's the word um, on the right, that would have been a scrolling game, too, that was uh, inspired by Mad Max movies that were out at the time. Uh, on the top was our attempt to start doing a flight simulator, so they needed a, a very symmetrical type of vehicle. So I, I did sketches of it, which got approved, and then I built models, which they were going to digitize and try to... Uh, create this a flight simulator which uh, at the time there weren't I, I don't know of very Dollar, many maybe yeah, maybe they were done in uh, maybe Atari was flat. doing a vector one but yeah, you know, they yeah. were trying to do a rasterized one um, Spy Hunter was another game I worked on I actually started getting my feet wet with comp the computerized uh, you know with the digital world on Spy Hunter Um, I wound up leaving under certain circumstances. I did, you know, wasn't agreeing with a, one, an employee that was that working there, and uh, so I wound up leaving. And um, I decided that I was going to, you know, start out on my own and freelance. So I immediately got hired back as a freelancer by Greg, who was, who emerged as the art director, or un, he, he was Paul's second, I don't know what you would call him, his assistant. And um, this was a John Trudeau game that, you know, he had very specific uh, ideas of what, what he wanted. He wanted, uh, you know, old fashioned 50s drive, drive in and. Uh, yeah, now how about, the cars. I noticed that you were period correct since the game is officially set in 1959 mm -hmm. and none of those cars are any later than 1959. Uh, was that you or was that Trudeau? No, that's, you know, I would either go buy models or just, you know, find reference. Um, you know, getting them from the right angle was, you know, quite a, quite a chore. But um, I think I did a lot of it with just buying little cars and models and, uh, you know, photographing them in perspective. Otherwise, it would have been you know, impossible to do. This is 
before we just they decided that there was going to be a display on the bottom this is what the back glass would have looked like this is the magic marker sketch and you know this empty white spot would have been where the display was the, the LED display that hmm. where he would you know uh, simulate the movie scenes and you know the rest of the scoring and all that but that's that's the original magic marker sketch for it there of course is the painting which you know I was going for a campy movie poster look on how about the license or approvals any trouble with them is, uh, I've heard licensing you, approval easy, was un for very universal. loose at that point with you <coughs> universal compared to what what it was uh, when we got up to monster bash in, late, in years later so this the side of this cabinet was all inked uh, with a brush and but but still we had uh, constraints on the number of colors this is probably four colors white green the yellowish highlight looks like or is that just white probably just white I think we were limited to four colors on this four you know solid silkscreen colors this I wish I had yeah I think this is this is the uh, magic marker sketch so anyone familiar with the artwork can see that you know it was I was following it was approved almost as is and I followed it very closely with my painting but this is all magic marker I have most of these magic marker sketches still so I keep them in the drawer and they're still nice and bright you know fun to look at uh, Flintstones Flintstones is a game that I kept because uh, all of the uh, the actors involved John Goodman uh, Rosie O'Donnell Rick Moranis had all signed the back glass so I still have it to this day and my grandchildren play it all the time and here again the idea of the drive-in down on the uh, oh yeah they recycled move your car yeah in Flintstones <laughs> This is us having a little bit of fun on a movie set, which um, it was always great. We went on the movie set of, a, I think it was Star Trek One or it was whatever, whatever the one or two that that had a, a scene out where it was supposed to be out in a snowy planet uh, landscape, and I had on that day I had a, a black jacket and I, I was all dressed in black. But they were blowing around this styrofoam, and it was sticking to, to We were very close to where they were filming, and it was sticking to me. But this is the town of Bedrock, Bedrock which was they built in a quarry. And they, um, we were driven out there one day, and they just let us run through the buildings and play, play around in there. So that, that was a fun, fun day. Uh, the play field, um, I also have this game because uh, a lot of my designs were approved for the sculpture of this. Uh, along the sides, you see the town of Bed Bedrock and um, you know the dinosaur in the back. Those I, I'd done uh, concept renderings for all of those, and they wound up in the game. So I hung on to it for all these years. So, so who did the sculpting? Did you sculpt, or did you? It was have, probably uh, at that time. It was probably Dave Link. He, the biggest a, name in pinball sculpture that yes. I've heard. Mm -hmm. Dave Link did some Yeah, he's stuff. an interesting guy. Uh, I hope you get to meet him someday. Uh, this is a. Uh, these. This is a the magic marker sketch from uh, Monster Batch, which George. Uh, you know, I borrowed some of these from George. It had notes on there. The girls in the cages nixed by Universal. <laughs> So they didn't belong in there for some reason. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I think I, a few things have changed in the background. I had the mausoleum behind Dracula, and I think I still had the the two beds back there. Maybe I had one bed back there, but uh, the pyramid was gone. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, that, that's the sketch for that. Here's some more of things I borrowed from George. Uh, just an idea, quick facts from KO to George Gomez. 
and um, these are the original. You know, I put on some sort of corny tagline: "Universal Monsters Live at Budokan," uh, which was like cheap, at the time it was cheap. Trick was live at Budokan or something yeah, like that, or the Hollywood Bowl or something like that. Yeah. So it was just a, a way to. Uh, here's a idea for the Dracula character I put on there, Dracabilly, and George had written on here the stump guitar, which was nixed by well, just about everyone. <laughs> but I wound up I, I believe this wound up as the bo back box. And I had uh, two arms and hands on there. One was playing the guitar, and the other one was uh, fingering the fretboard. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and you're a guitarist yourself. That's correct. Do you decorate your own guitar for live I, performance? No, I, I, I don't decorate guitars. <laughs> um, I have a lot of guitars, and um, I, I played all the way up till this summer. Um, because of COVID, it was only about halfway through summer, uh, festivals started coming back. And uh, I'll only play either a festival or uh, like a show that's maybe an hour and a half to two hours long. And, you know, the band I'm in knows that I won't play in a bar anymore for stand on my feet for four hours. I just can't do it. My fingers won't, won't do it anymore either. Um, this was probably... Uh, most complicated uh, has has the most technique on it painting that I am, am most proud of and uh, here again you know we're dealing with Lucas they were they were very picky about every how everything that looked and they there was a lot of uh, approval needed on all of this but I pretty much nailed it, you know, in the beginning. I did all the color sketches and everything that they needed. And this is a 30 by 40 painting, which um, they purchased from me. So once I, once I uh, realized that you could submit this to a committee who would pick out, uh, you know, uh, uh, many artists would submit Star Wars, uh, artwork to to Lucas for consideration to purchase and I was lucky enough they purchased this one and they paid very well too so and with that in mind I said well I have these other two paintings too and both of them were um, let me see here we go um, you know these are also 30 by 40 large paintings and, but they were split up into uh, you know the the back box and the side of the cabinet, but there are also a lot of intricate detail, and they took a long time. They're um, you know complicated pieces to do, so they said, well, we like the uh, we like the one with the good the good side they called it, and and uh, we're, we're not really that interested in the evil side. And I said, well, if you put them together, if you take a look at them, they're, they're like a, a, a puzzle piece that fits together. And they, and they said, oh, we see it now. Okay, we'll buy both of them. <laughs> so I wound up selling both of them. So you have sales skills as well. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, um, this is an example of how a painting would start out. Um, I would draw it on there with colored pencil you know, very, all the darks where it would, and then start blowing in lo local color with my airbrush, um, you know, giving, giving an idea where stars would be. And it, there was probably more stars, but the technique for my, for my star fields, which, you know, I was like, how, am I, how the heck am I going to get all these stars on there? Because if you look at a Star Wars movie, it's like deep space with, a, a, you know, millions of stars on there. <clears throat> And I came up with a technique of like I would dip a, dip a toothbrush just in the paint and then start just flicking it off to the side till I had just the right amount of stars and then I'd flick it onto my painting and that's how I got all the stars on there. Some people speckle their cabinets. That <laughs> There's me with a painting a little bit more in progress and this is in my studio which is where I was working out of as freelancer. Um, 
I had my airbrush uh, station right there, and and, it, and you can see right above my my drawing board, I had built my own little uh, exhaust system right in my studio. It helped a little bit, but you could see how dark the paint is that collected on there. Well, of course, I was breathing much of that in myself too. So that that shows how it got split up. The art got split up on the cabinet. Um, this is this is the um, if you call it the video portion of that was displayed on a mirror or from right. a mirror. There was the a, monitor was mirrored onto the special glass over the play field, so you you had to shoot everything reverse, I guess. To so John Papaduke, the designer of Star Wars Episode One, decided he was going to be Qui Gon Jinn, and he he asked me if there was a way that I could be. Darth Maul. I said, sure. I, I went and bought a blank mask. At the time, there were no Darth Maul masks, so I actually built this mask and put, made all the uh, horns out of foam and you know, painted the whole thing up. And um, we both actually took lessons from a, a I believe it's, it was a Taekwondo where they use wep different weapons and they showed us, you know, stick fighting. Taekwondo stick fighting. So we took some lessons. I got the rest of the uh, outfit together, and they filmed us in front of this green screen, and put in the, all the backgrounds later on. So here's us, you know, doing our thing. There's me wearing my mask, and there's John Papaduke in his outfit. So um, I don't. Know, it was when we, when I got done with that. It was probably. It felt like it was 90 with the with all that gear on, and and we were soaked from head to toe, both of us. In 1985, um, I got a call from a person I had no idea who the, who he was, Joe Camico. Could you please come in and take a look at a game that we had? And it, little was I did I know that I was the adventure that I was about to go on for the, to this day with Joe Camico. But he was with Game Plan at the time, and I walked into their uh, facility, which is on Peterson Avenue in Chicago, and it was just Gary and Joe there. And that's when I met Gary Stern, who you know, we're good friends to this day. Gary's a great guy. I love him to death. Uh, this was the first game that they had me work on. It was a Loch Ness Monster, and this is as far as I got with it. It was with the play field and the plastics. And the rest, I don't know all the history of how or why it never became anything, but I don't, I'm not sure if there was a back glass, if there was another artist yeah. who came in to do the back glass, but. It was a wide body, and so it had a high bill of materials cost. It was a okay. pretty expensive proposition there. Okay. Um, so the first game that Data East actually produced was Laser War. And I did layouts for, and so we're, this is going to be photography. He was good friends with a photographer. I believe it was Don Marshall who took these photos. And also Joe's sister was a costume, uh, she was a, a fashion designer. So it was like, I'm going to have my sister come in and design all these costumes. And um, so I drew up the set and how it could possibly work um, in a concept sketch. And this is this 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 was the photographic result, uh, the play field and plastics. I I did all those. The, the the cabinet was a stencil on this, and I did this back uh, artwork for that was done strictly for the uh, for the flyer for the flyer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next one again another photographic one where Joe was you know very good friends with this photographer. So they said, well, we're going to simulate uh, Washington, D.C. by going up to Madison, Wisconsin. Their Capitol building looks very much in a miniature way like the Capitol in Washington, D.C. So, you know, it was sort of not being able to get a James Bond license at the time or circumventing a James Bond license by, you know, creating their own scene here. Uh, Torpedo Alley. I have kind of a, a, 
I, I did a layout for this also. I, I, I did the logo and I did this background naval scene here. But um, <clears throat> just a, an, a side anecdote that maybe people do or don't know is the captain with the red uh, jacket on had tights on very similar to the girls. And when we finally got all the photos, everybody agreed, the tights have got to go. So I retouched the photo to put regular pants on them. Uh, this is the magic marker sketch for King Kong. And it was quite complicated because of the fact that Joe wanted the Chicago skyline. He wanted the, the Sears Tower and the John Hancock building to replace the Empire State Building. So, you know, I had to use reference for the Chicago River and, um, you know, I added things to the painting that aren't, you, you won't see here, like reflections of the sunset in the building and so on. But this is the magic marker sketch. And I thought you guys would like to see sketches more than the paintings that you've already seen. But this is the painting in progress and, you know, I would mask off the side so I could, you know, test my colors out, but that's the painting in progress. Robocop, eh, I didn't, it was, I, I, at least I finally got another chance to do some art on that, but there was, you know, very little reference that they gave us, and I, I don't even know if I knew what the whole movie was going to be like. I don't think it, they showed us the, we didn't get any previews of it, we just got a few, and the same thing with Flash Gordon, all they gave us was a booklet that they were going to Sometimes after you came out of a movie, you could buy the booklet that, uh, of the movie. And that's all I had on that, too, so there was very little reference. I don't know why. I just, this one, that's, that's retro. just a... Retro. Here yeah. comes the retro yeah. again. Uh, there's the brochure. They always call on you for the retro material, <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah, this was before Joe was able to procure a license. If he couldn't get it... The, right away or when he wanted it, he would go off and do something, you know, similar to it. So this was before he was actually able to acquire the uh, Back to the Future. And, you know, we worked out a way to to uh, do a, a time-related, time travel-related theme. That's what we came up with. And um, I used, I used, this was my ex-wife in the front, this was Margaret in the back. In the back was a guy, he was a friend of Joe's, but Joe said put him in there and put, his, put him in there with his high school uh, jacket on. And this was sort of a John Travolta character, uh, Saturday night, he represented the, the 70s, I believe. In a 59 Cadillac back end? Yeah. <laughs> with a uh, futuristic, this is a magic marker sketch for a uh, for for the Star Trek the second one second one I did for Data East and um, this one this one was this one was the one they selected in favor of the two and I think I think it was a four color I'm pretty sure it was a four color here's a sketch for the Backlash that not too many people get to see. Um, that's not how it wound up looking. Yeah, because it was a yeah, this transported is a, device. Here we go. Here, this is a magic marker sketch also. So you can see I was getting pretty intricate with my uh, magic markers at the time and just adding in little touches of, uh, you know, brushwork. Also, so, so you started you started on this game before Joe told you that we're going to have this magic screen thing in the middle then I think if we go back to here that's when I didn't know it was going to be in there I think I knew it was going to be in here yeah because it's so central yeah. so I have this painting do. but the middle is blank because the the crew had to be painted separately so they were painted on a separate board and this part, this part of the painting is empty uh, sadly this is a magic marker sketch for the Playboy 35th anniversary, which, you know, we went to the Playboy Mansion and uh, 
Work, work, work. Uh, yeah, work was work. <laughs> um, this is at the point where Hugh Hefner said that his he wanted his, um, I think it was Kimberly Conrad became his wife, but she was just his girlfriend at this point. And he wanted her to be featured, and he had another favorite uh, playmate, Ava Fabian. She's pictured out in front here. And she was in a couple movies, uh, like a ski school or something like that. She wound up in a couple B-type B movies. And you can see uh, I was starting to put in the, uh, the granny character in the back and add, you know, it, the, I was going to add characters. At this point, we knew this was going to be a photograph, but we knew that I was also going to add in characters from the, uh, from the magazine. Here's a sketch that uh, they went in favor of the pool scene, but this is a, a, a photo shoot concept that uh, I w it wasn't rejected. It was just a second place. Yeah, second place. And that's how it ended up. And I think I remember you telling stories of this. This is like the most complicated composite you had done up to that point. Yes. Uh, Hugh Hefner and Kimberly Conrad were not in this photo. They were super, uh, they were stripped in, I guess we used to call it back then, but everything else was in place. I'm between Annie Fanny sitting at a table and the girl in the blue bathing suit was from, a, I believe, a show called Full House, something like this. And then, um, Ava Fabian wound up being in the back next to that bunny back there. So any of these, you know, I painted any of these other little uh, add-ins, the, okay, so. the granny character and the Annie Fanny. So, you know, there was, it was a little bit complicated at the time. Here's, I did a straight airbrush painting for this back, uh, back, back glass, another Playboy on um, you know, a photographic uh, side to the cabinet, but all the rest of it was done with you know, traditional ink and uh, color on the play field. Monday Night Football, I, I don't know why I have this. I, I'm not, not particularly proud of this, but it was something Joe said, I, got, I need this done in three days. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, <laughs> here you go. The Simpsons. It was a fun project to work on, and at this point, they really let me do what, put it together however I wanted to. With but my sketches would come back with corrections on the side, you know, make make a th this you know. Right, like the number of spikes and yeah, Bart's well, head has to be what the style make guy. Make his says. fingers a little bit fatter, you know. Came back with all a lot of corrections on it, but this is one that made an early one that made it through with before you know licensing became so intricate and complicated well but there is one thing uh that has matt Groening's signature that yes. was part of the license right that yes yeah i was i was not able to sign that one but I, i'm here to tell you people that <laughs> i did do this artwork and of course, the playfield, they, they had no idea what to do with the playfield. So, you know, they were fine with me doing whatever I wanted on that with their corrections or additions, you know, have, um, I, I don't know, they would have, have a donut by Homer or whatever, whatever suggestion they would make. That just shows a little bit more detail. Well, this is the other. The yeah, I think on this one they, they did a, like an S, S, um, we call it tracing paper overlay over the whole thing and did made little corrections, which, you know, that's fine. I wound up doing all the inking and everything for it. Sopranos, uh, the, back to photography uh, because of the license, but uh, this is a stern game. Um, Batman had, they were getting pretty complicated or intricate with their style guides. So there are things that in this back glass that 
art style guide comp you know that I've composited the Batman the Joker the bike the bat bike and the tumbler I think they call it a tumbler car but all the portraits are paint what we call paint over so they were they're photographs that are vary in quality and they need tightening and so you know I, I basically have to paint over the photograph to sharpen it or get more color into and the it. Shadows, you yes. Have to also, do the all shadows. these characters in the back, plus um, the Joan, Maggie Joan Hall character, those are all paint overs done by me. And the relative sizes of the heads uh, is part of the. Yeah, approvals. That's, that's my. You know, my he has to be bigger than anybody yeah, else yeah. and all that. And so I have to composite all that together. This. Uh, when I did Pirates of the Caribbean, we got a time crunch to get it into production, and I had it all mapped out, you know, photographically composited of how I wanted to do it, and then I transferred that on to a board and started painting it, and we lost, they lost track of time on that and said, we're going to have to just use your, your photographic composite, but so this got, this got about, 50% of the way through it was finished. And um, I went back a few years later and finished it off. So this is the actual painting that I own now. And it's very much looks like what wound up being the back glass of the pinball machine. Terminator 2, that was my first game with Steve Ritchie. You know, I was a, a little nervous about, but we actually got along great. And Steve's a great guy. and. He's, he's got a, like sort of a rough exterior, but but you know underneath he's he's uh, okay. So and we talked before about how in the Bally days things were being just plopped over the fence to the art department. Like here's here's what it's going to be. Put art on top mm -hmm. of it. Where are you now in working with the Steve and the team? Are you uh, getting stuff like handed to you? Are you doing more back and forth or? In there every day, or where are you in terms of well, how involved you are? I worked with Steve on, on some Star Trek stuff, and that was strictly through Lucas. Everything we did was through Lucas. Um, this, you know, there was there's a lot of style guide involved in Terminator Three, and I don't know if you're asking me well about then or now. Okay, well. <laughs> Uh, so have you, at, at this point in time, turned a corner where, as far as the game design, you're hearing more about what's going on with the game as it progresses on the play field layout and such, or are you still just... I, I, I probably got Terminator 3 uh, at a point where insert-wise and, you know, the blueprints at the time that they would give you were you know, 85% there on, on Terminator. Um, and at this point, I was still a little bit imita uh, intimidated by uh, Steve. Um, but as we got to know each other, you know, he softened up over the years. Mm -hmm. um, Avatar was uh, all style guide composites. Um, 3D? Yeah, this was a, I think they call it lenticular lens, so it had had some depth to it. So there was a lot, a lot of technical stuff involved in you know, producing this back glass. Um, there were parts missing from, at this point I was you know, getting my feet pretty, pretty well solid, solidly uh, footed in. Um, di the digital world. Um, that was because I was working, I started working on a real job too, and that was IGT. Joe took me in the back of Stern one day and said, Kevin, I'm leaving here. I'm going to Las Vegas to, um, to head up a, a slot machine. You're coming with me. I was like, I'm, This is I like 1998. I, wanna, yeah, I don't know if I want to move to a uh, Las Vegas, Joe. So I decided that I, I really wasn't going to take the job because I didn't want to move my family and so on. He said, "All right, you're going to work. You're going to telecommunicate, commute, 
which at the at that point I was like, I'm going to how who, do what, you know, because <laughs> it was a fairly new. Uh, yeah, you could order up internet service at uh, yeah. megabit speeds. But you know, my experiences with I, IGT, I, I was starting to uh, you know, get get my feet wet with the digital world. So I, I, I believe that parts that were missing of these floating mountains and things, they, they weren't complete. So I, I start to put them together and paint over them to, to make them complete. Because when you look behind, you know, like this uh, Yeah, well, big a good dragon, example, Lou, the letter R on top of that wing. As you walk past the game, you will see the R and the wing move relative to each other. Yeah, it was, it was mostly like some of these, like the flying dragon, that mountain was behind him, but the re you know, once you removed the dragon, there was a blank spot all the way through there, but it needed to be completed because you could see behind it. Spider-Man, um, mostly style guide. Yeah, mirroring. I, I think I took, I, there was another version of this, so I took this, stuff out because it's just I mean I put it all together you know these are you know they give you a cityscape and then they'll give you all the different characters and I, I added explosions and uh, light rays things like that to it um, here again a lot of style guide but really tricky to put together you know the cityscape and you know, it wasn't it wasn't exactly how I wanted the perspective to be, so you know there's a lot, lot to do there, and there's touches of my art in there also. But you know, it's all got to got to work together. X Men, isn't that I don't know. <coughs> same thing here? Lucy, they came to me and they said that they wanted to do more of a retro style with the ink and flat color. And um, I, I didn't really know that much about ACDC, so I kind of delve into their world and come up with, I came up with sketches and they liked them. So that's, that's where that's at. So you were more a rockabilly guy by your musical preference then? Um, yes. Uh, well, the, the, band is, the band I'm in, or have mostly have always been in his like 50s and 60s. So we'll do mostly like, you know, of the 50s, it's Jerry Lee Lewis and Eddie Cochran, you know, stuff like that, Elvis Presley. And then we'll, we'll uh, kind of spill over into the 60s or like early 60s Beatles and Rolling Stones. So um, it's, been, it's been fun. Um, I'm, it's, it's a little harder to do than it used to be for me. You know, I, we don't have... A, roadies or anything like that so i'm all usually hoisting my own stuff up on these stages and, you know it gets it gets tiring um kiss uh i think when they s told them that it was the original artist was going to be on this project they they uh asked uh, he's still alive <laughs> so, <laughs> so so they were surprised but they let me go on uh, the at this point, the back glass had shrunk, you know, height-wise, so that presented a challenge. And the only way I could get the drummer and Ace Fraley in there was to have him down in a crouched position because that's all I had left. I didn't want Gene or 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 Paul Stanley to be crouched down. I didn't think they would like that. And Ace Fraley, at this point, I don't believe he was involved with the band or any of the approvals. So. I was able to do whatever I want. And then, you know, I did sort of a retro play field, ink, ink flat color looking. And the cabinet is the reprise of your belly yes, cabinet. Yes, but, but all four color yeah. drawn, painted. There's one of the sketches. I, I presented everything in black and white at first. And there's a sketch of the cabinet, which stayed pretty much the same. There's this, this is a sketch of a girl that was gonna go on a game. Uh, can't really say which one, but. 
Yeah, here's Batman. This is Batman 66, which I did the play field for. And there's all sorts of different things going on here. There's style guide. Um, there's digital. There's a digital city that we created. And um, the portraits, I had them all in place where they were going to be, but I believe Christopher Franchi took, took them and enhanced them. And he's a, a fantastic artist. And he loves to do uh, Batman stuff. He, he does a lot of Batman stuff. He's sort of official Batman guy, so they, yeah. they got and him into And he brags finish. about how fast he works, too. So, another point. Uh, yeah, and, and you got to remember at this point, um, Stern knows that I'm, I'm working at IGT and I have a limited amount of time to... And I'm working full time in the day, so I'm just doing this on the side. But a lot of these really super talented artists that they find to come in and and uh, do these jobs, they they don't want to do the play field. You know, it's it's a there's an art it, itself to doing the play field and being able to re read all the engineering drawings, which evolves over you know my whole career basically. And you know what what size the inserts are going to be, how yeah. what the tolerances of the ink that's going to be around the Greg talks trap, about that too. Okay. Is you know yeah. you can bring in these great artists who do you know give them a rectangle the size of a back glass yeah. and say fill this with something very dynamic that will catch the bar patron and they're fine. But when it gets mm -hmm. into yeah, look at all these little circles you have to work around and I'm uh, going to keep moving here. We can. Uh, Game of Thrones. They came to me with a time crunch. At this time, at this time, I had moved to uh, an online gaming co company that Joe had created uh, called Zynga. We eventually got bought out by. Oh, well, no, they were affiliated with a with Zynga was the parent company in San Francisco. So Greg knew that I couldn't take on a whole game, but they they got in a time crunch and asked me to. You know, do paint overs and uh, you know do the do the layouts and, and uh, you know color correcting for a couple of the back glasses for Game of Thrones. This is based on uh, sketches from a Star Wars artist called Bob Stevlick that they uh, they had hired to do all the Star Wars stuff. He's he's sort of a a staple in the Star Wars stable, if you will. But uh, let me tell you something: until you draw all the uh, all the details on an on a Imperial Walker or any of these vehicles, you you just don't know what you're in for. And um, so there's quite a bit of detail. Each one I did had to do on a separate file because there were so many layers to just an Imperial Walker. I, I wouldn't be able to put this whole scene together in one file till the very end. Well, so I would, you know, draw the the walkers, I mean, draw them, paint them, all in one file, and then flatten it so that when I put it in this landscape, which I also painted, there weren't as many layers. It would be just one layer for a vehicle, one layer for explosions, one layer for you know walkers, and so on. But you know, I'm I'm pretty proud of the way it's turned out. Mostly because of the fact that it went came back from Lucas with virtually no no changes on it. So there's another one I did, also based on Bob Bob Stevlick's original uh, concepts. This one of the most complicated drawings I've ever done in my life. I mean, if you can, uh, I don't know. If, we can't really zoom in on it, but if the closer you get, the more. The more you see, and the less you'll be able to identify what is the shape. You don't know what the shapes are. If there's some sort of a pipe that comes around like this, if it's a panel, you don't know what they are. They are just shapes, and you know. But I had to sharpen them all to to make this thing, you know, digitally work. And so this this is just a mountain of layers for to get this uh, done. I mean, you know. Try it on a Sunday afternoon if you have got <laughs> nothing else to do. Yeah, after you did that crossword. Yeah, so, yeah. 
This is, uh, let me see. Yeah, I don't, yeah this is yeah, this, some non pinball stuff. Yeah, this set of, uh, this doesn't, I, I had another set that showed the evolution of the, the Black Knight, but it was one of my original sketches that had a mace in it, and this is before Steve actually put the mace, had that mace idea. Um, and it was just going to be a, a bash toy that had sort of a mace attached to a chain, and Steve got the idea to get it. Make moving. it spin. Yeah. yeah. So I did a lot of complicated art for backgrounds, a, con a lot of concept, marker concepts for, for Zynga and IGT. And this is all simultaneously while I'm trying to stay in pinball, too which I don't do anymore. And uh, when I turned 65, I retired from slot machines forever and went back to pinball. But this is an idea of, uh, um, I go back to the future game we did where I would have done all the backgrounds and I did all the symbols also. So, you know, there's, there's a whole new uh, learning curve to the size of symbols and how their importance that you you know needed to uh, needed to learn. These are con more concepts for uh, actually these are finished backgrounds that are also very complicated with lots of layers. There's this is Biff's penthouse for Back to the Future, and um, this was pretty challenging. Uh, the I think it's Hill Valley, as they call it. The town square. Yeah, the town square in the future. Yeah. And there weren't, all there were were like, you know, you know, a, a view of, of the building here, a view of the courthouse there, and I put it all together. So it was a kind of pretty complicated illustration for me. And they call these picking games where you just, you know, touch, touch on your. All these glowing things. Yes, things all to the, touch. yeah, those yeah. are all glowing pick items. This is for a slot machine. I had a great time doing this. This is this was done traditionally. It's probably one of the last traditional things I did at IGT. Uh, problem with it doing traditional art. I still have this painting, by the way. And it was so much fun for me to do as an Elvis Presley fan. And you know, I'm like I get to paint guitars and you know, make sure they're uh, uh, correct guitar yeah, or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the problem was they stopped me from doing that because they couldn't manipulate it or stretch it into a, any other uh, format. So they stopped me from doing that, and from then on, I had to do everything digital. I did, uh, I did a hundred of these different, where I would design what they called a facades, which is the part down on the bottom. Around the, or that goes around uh, uh, game elements that they would have. Uh, that was also a painting. That that the center game element was also a painting that was sort of back where they backlit the drops. So there was all all, all sorts of different ways that they were would uh, display uh, a side game that you would play. But I did all these toppers. Uh, here's one for Animal House. That's a sketch for an Animal House facade. And then later on, Joe um, developed a group, uh, the Inno Innovation Design Group, that uh, he was working on a community. He was trying to get this community game concept going. So here's one for Star Wars. These are some... Uh, another favorite for the retro art people, yeah, Rock and Roll. I did a lot of uh, redemption, what they call ticket spitters, redemption games. That there were there was a time when I could walk into a Chuck E. Cheese and see you know three or four of my games in there. I worked very closely with Bromley uh, when, when she first started her comp company, Lauren Bromley, and um, I did some other things. Here's a Sea Wolf illustration. A completely digital um, rock and bowl was the old style with the ink and the screens. So this kind of gives you an idea how pinball 
has evolved into the psyche of advertising people and you know moved off into directions that you never thought you would you'd see so i got a call i think they're called the wow factors they said we're from the wow factor and we want we want you to uh, do artwork for a sign on time times square uh for the coca-cola company so you know i was very surprised i was very excited to do it and i said i can do it i'll make you know i can i can paint all the digitally paint where all the shots are going to be and they say we're going to be it's going to be food oriented oriented but i was very surprised when they gave me the the layout that i had to follow and it was all these squiggly lines in here and they said you're going to have to do your art you know within the confines of this so that got that got pretty challenging for me but you know i, I wound up walking in times square one night and then was able to photograph it and um and this is like a changing image so we see yes. just two examples of what fills in those different shapes no this went to uh this went to an animator who put you know animated flippers in there i don't i didn't paint the flippers and he put animated flippers and made the ball uh you know it, it actually was looked like it was playing while you were looking at it that was uh, probably around 2000, something around. It's dated 2005. 2005? Okay. Oh, it's got a date on it, 2005. Well, that's when the photograph was taken, so I probably will start working on this maybe two years before that. Um, here's one where I got a call from some people in France, and the idea is that in Paris, Everyone's car is bashed in because they their parking is so tight there that it, it, it was explained to me that um, that's why there's so many you know fender bender looking cars that, that are driving around Paris because they, they haphazardly try to get into any spot they can and so they were going to display <clears throat> they just Push they were the gonna other cars. They were going to film cars trying to get into this spot. And this was actually for Ford, and the the, the product of the Ford was uh, they were trying to uh, sell their self parking car, and um, so Ford hired this company to do this billboard that would um, <clears throat> display. You know, they had a camera on the car trying to park, and every time it, it would hit hit it hit. You know, one of the parked cars, it would light up. You know, you're clumsy, you're cruel, brutal, savage, you're a monster. I think and, there were <laughs> pinball sound effects in the animated version. And next to it, you see uh, the, the near finished product. There was a video uh, of it. I, I don't have the video, but it's it's around in pinball circles. You can see. Yeah. It. Champion, vous. Vous avez de la chance aujourd'hui, on compense le plus mauvais conducteur. Parked cars, pinball, France. The idea is how pinball has, you know, transcended the, from the game it is into the psyche of people. Yeah. 
throughout the world, basically. So, and I noticed that it, the car that's getting all bashed up in the center here is a Chevy, and the <laughs> Ford is going to self-park. Uh, this is a 60 Chevy here. Yeah, if I, if I look close, they may have changed that, but... Uh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, I... 60 got, Chevy Impala convertible. I want to give some credit to Pat McMahon, who's a, a genius when it comes to, like, cartooning. If I get in a bind where I really need, a, you know, an expression like on this, I needed this girl's expression in the front. I, I would call on Pat, and he'd always be happy to help me out. And every time I, you'd get something, you'd just go, "This guy's a genius," and it's evident in his all his pinball machines too. The expressions on people's faces. He's a, he's just great at uh, cartooning. Um, I think that might be it. Well, thanks for staying an extra long time. I think oh, this is this is the best <laughs> profile of the work you've done. And sometime we got to get you and Lauren Bromley together up front here and talk about some of that non-pinball work too. That is is so much fun, and a lot of it is very pinball inspired too. Yeah, um, she did one. I think she did one. It was a. It looked like a pinball machine. I, I had it in one of my sl slideshows here. It looked like a pinball machine, but it was a, a co coin roller. But, you know, it had ramps and stuff that, that went, you could go up. Yeah, drop the coin and Yeah, I did down. that one, too. I can't remember what that one was called. But. Well, there's so many. Yeah. Uh, but, <clears throat> yeah, certainly Rock and Bowl was one of their best sellers. Yeah. All right, well, we have to... Take a little lunch break here, but I hope you've all learned a lot about uh, how Kevin, one of the pinball greats, works. And I'm so glad to hear that he's done with slot machines to be all <laughs> pinball all the time. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. And thanks to Dave and everyone at Pintastic who's been really great to me.